Critique of Judgment by Immanuel Kant The Critique of Judgment, Critique der Heilskraft, also translated as The Critique of the Power of Judgment, is a 1790 book by the German philosopher Immanuel Kant, sometimes referred to as the Third Critique. The Critique of Judgment follows the Critique of Pure Reason, 1781 and the Critique of Practical Reason, 1788. Immanuel Kant's Critique of Judgment is the third critique in Kant's critical project. Begun in the Critique of Pure Reason and the Critique of Practical Reason. The first and second critiques, respectively. The book is divided into two main sections, the Critique of Aesthetic Judgment, and the Critique of Teleological Judgment and also includes a large overview of the entirety of Kant's critical system. Arranged in its final form, the so-called first introduction was not published during Kant's lifetime. For Kant wrote a replacement for publication. The critical project, that of exploring the limits and conditions of knowledge, had already produced the critique of pure reason, in which Kant argued for a transcendental aesthetic. An approach to the problems of perception in which space and time are argued not to be objects. The first critique argues that space and time provide ways in which the observing subject's mind organizes and structures the sensory world. The end result of this inquiry in the first critique is that there are certain fundamental antinomies in the human reason. Most particularly that there is a complete inability to favor on the one hand the argument that all behavior and thought is determined by external causes. And on the other that there is an actual spontaneous causal principle at work in human behavior. The first position, of causal determinism, is adopted, in Kant's view, by empirical scientists of all sorts, moreover. It led to the idea, perhaps never fully to be realized, of a final science in which all empirical knowledge could be synthesized into a full and complete causal explanation of all events possible to the world. The second position, of spontaneous causality, is implicitly adopted by all people as they engage in moral behavior. This position is explored more fully in the critique of practical reason. The critique of judgment constitutes a discussion of the place of judgment itself which must overlap both the understanding, Verstad, which so ever operates from within a deterministic framework, and reason, Vernunft, which operates on the grounds of freedom. Introduction to the Critique of Judgment The first part of Kant's Critique of Aesthetic Judgment presents what Kant calls the four moments of the judgment of taste. These are given by Kant in sequence as the 1. First moment of the judgment of taste, moment of quality. 2. Second moment of the judgment of taste, moment of quantity. 3. Third moment of judgment of taste. Moment of the relation of the ends brought under review in such judgments, and 4. Fourth moment of the judgment of taste moment of the modality of the delight in the object. After the presentation of the four moments of the judgment of taste, Kant then begins his discussion of Book Two of the Third Critique, titled Analytic of the Sublime. Aesthetic Judgment. The first part of the book discusses the four possible aesthetic reflective judgments. The agreeable, the beautiful, the sublime, and the good. Kant makes it clear that these are the only four possible reflective judgments. As he relates them to the table of judgments from the critique of pure reason. Reflective judgments differ from determinative judgments, those of the first two critiques. In reflective judgment we seek to find unknown universals for given particulars. Whereas in determinative judgment, we just subsume given particulars under universals that are already known, as Kant puts it. It is then one thing to say, the production of certain things of nature or that of collective nature is only possible through a cause which determines itself to action according to design. And quite another to say, I can according to the peculiar constitution of my cognitive faculties judge concerning the possibility of these things and their production. 
in no other fashion than by conceiving for this a cause working according to design, i.e. a being which is productive in a way analogous to the causality of an intelligence. In the former case I wish to establish something concerning the object, and am bound to establish the objective reality of an assumed concept, in the latter. Reason only determines the use of my cognitive faculties, conformably to their peculiarities and to the essential conditions of their range and their limits. Thus the former principle is an objective proposition for the determinant judgment, the latter merely a subjective proposition for the reflective judgment, i.e. a maxim which reason prescribes to it. The agreeable is a purely sensory judgment. Judgments in the form of this stake is good, or this chair is soft. These are purely subjective judgments, based on inclination alone. The good is essentially a judgment that something is ethical. The judgment that something conforms with moral law, which, in the Kantian sense, is essentially a claim of modality, a coherence with a fixed and absolute notion of reason. It is in many ways the absolute opposite of the agreeable, in that it is a purely objective judgment. Things are either moral or they are not, according to Kant. The remaining two judgments, the beautiful and the sublime, differ from both the agreeable and the good. They are what Kant refers to as subjective universal judgments. This apparently oxymoronic term means that, in practice, the judgments are subjective, and are not tied to any absolute and determinate concept. However, the judgment that something is beautiful or sublime is made with the belief that other people ought to agree with this judgment, even though it is known that many will not. The force of this ought comes from a reference to a sensus communi. A community of taste. Hannah Arendt, in her lectures on Kant's political philosophy, suggests the possibility that this sensus communi might be the basis of a political theory that is markedly different from the one that Kant lays out in the metaphysic of morals. The central concept of Kant's analysis of the judgment of beauty is what he called the free play between the cognitive powers of imagination and understanding. We call an object beautiful, because its form fits our cognitive powers and enables such a free play the experience of which is pleasurable to us. The judgment that something is beautiful is a claim that it possesses the form of finality. That is, that it appears to have been designed with a purpose. Even though it does not have any apparent practical function, we also do not need to have a determinate concept for an object in order to find it beautiful. In this regard, Kant further distinguishes between free and adherent beauty. Whereas judgments of free beauty are made without having one determinate concept for the object being judged, for example an ornament or well-formed line. A judgment of beauty is adherent if we do have such a determined concept in mind, for example a well-built horse that is recognized as such. The main difference between these two judgments is that purpose or use of the object plays no role in the case of free beauty. In contrast, adherent judgments of beauty are only possible if the object is not ill-suited for its purpose. The judgment that something is sublime is a judgment that it is beyond the limits of comprehension. That it is an object of fear. However, Kant makes clear that the object must not actually be threatening. It merely must be recognized as deserving of fear. Kant's view of the beautiful and the sublime is frequently read as an attempt to resolve one of the problems left following his depiction of moral law in the critique of practical reason. Namely that it is impossible to prove that we have free will, and thus impossible to prove that we are bound under moral law. The beautiful and the sublime both seem to refer to some external nominal order and thus to the possibility of a nominal self that possesses free will. In this section of the critique Kant also establishes a faculty of mind that is in many ways the inverse of judgment. The faculty of genius. Whereas judgment allows one to determine whether something is beautiful or sublime, genius allows one to produce what is beautiful or sublime. End of the topic.